it's almost as though one were playing Russian roulette and there were a 20 chamber gun with five different kinds of bullets. One question could be, what kind of bullet is it that's going to get you? It seems to me a more appropriate question is, do we even want to play Russian roulette? If you have a kind of society which is going to eat the, the very planet we're on, eat it up, consume it, uh, you will find that there's nothing left. So what do we do about population? How will we control our desires to have children? I've been working in schools, universities and colleges for the last two decades, mostly teaching biology. One of the things the students often ask me is what is the single greatest thing that they can personally do to reduce their impact on the environment. Some had looked in textbooks, but the answer wasn't there, even though it probably should be. And because of this, I decided to make a film. A film that I consider the most important lesson that I've ever taught. Okay, imagine you're living in a country where you're told um, currently it's not sustainable. Um, you're using more than the land can provide or more than nature can provide. Um, roughly how much would you be willing to cut back on your consumption? Um, tell you what, use your fingers, okay? If you're willing to cut back 50%, that's 50%. If you're willing to cut back 100%, that's unlikely you'd be dead, okay? <laughs> but how much roughly would you be willing to cut back? 10%, 20%, how much? Do you, you say how much. Okay, so we've got a range there, 20%, 40%, maybe 50%, okay? So you'd be willing to use 50% less than you do now, yeah? 50% less of everything, okay? Everything, okay. All right, interesting. So a range there of what, 20 to 50%, yeah? <laughs> Okay, the map that you can see on the board at the moment, this shows um, all of the countries that are in ecological debt. Okay, so in other words, the countries that are using more than nature can provide. So if they're in red, they are either in trouble already, 
or they're relying on non-renewable resources, so coal, oil, and gas. Okay? And the vast majority of the ones in red are doing just that. If you split up all of the land on the whole planet and spread it out equally, we'd all get 1.8 hectares of productive land each. Okay? The average use globally is 2.7 hectares. Okay? So we're using more than nature can provide. The rest being filled up with fossil fuels and non-renewable resources. I want to talk about some environmentally friendly actions on the board. We've got a few. Um, changing light bulbs, changing an electric car to car free, um, using a more efficient car, washing your clothes in, in cold water, taking a, or taking one less transatlantic flight. Um, if you had to put those in the order of which is the most environmentally friendly thing you could do, which would you put at the top and which one would you put at the bottom of those? Basically, the transatlantic flight is worse. Okay, transatlantic flight is worse, you're saying. Okay, good. Okay. I'm going to show you uh, the different ones. So, right over here, living car free has the most impact. And right down here, you've got the, uh, the light bulbs. Changing light bulbs doesn't do a huge amount. So, those bubbles represent how many tons of carbon you would reduce your impact by, okay, by those different actions. What I want to show you now is there you can see the impact of having one fewer children compared to all of those other environmental actions you could take. Comments? Big? Pretty much. Pretty big, yeah. So you could do all of those things and still not have the same impact um, as if you had one uh, fewer children. Okay, that's the first thing I want to show you. Um, the next thing I want to show you is this. This is the um, from the United Nations. It's the population projection um, for the world population. And what it shows on there um, is the impact of having different numbers of children over time. Okay. We're currently at um, 7.6 billion. Okay. Currently at 7.6 billion. And it took humans hundreds of thousands of years to reach one billion. Okay, what year do you think we reached one billion in, roughly? Maybe in the 1800s or 1910s? Okay, about, about 1800. Okay, so we're at one billion globally at 1800. Um, it took 130 years later to get to two billion. Three billion happened 30 years after that. Four billion was 14 years after that. Five billion was 12 years after that. And now, today, we're at the 7.6 billion mark. Okay, um, We add around 10,000 people per hour. So that's 1.5 million a week. So in two weeks, you add a Berlin's worth of people. Okay, And in one month, you add a London to the planet.
Imagine you ring up a hotel and you say, yeah, I, I need some rooms. They ask you how many rooms? 1.5 million, you got space. It's gonna be difficult to accommodate. Admittedly, that is spread around the whole globe, but it's gonna be difficult to do. To give you an idea when we're gonna add the next billion, it's gonna take 13 years. So that is the entire population of North and South America combined, <coughs> okay, in 13 years from now. We're gonna add four billion in the next 80 years. Every person is gonna need resources, water, land, soil, shelter, hopefully a lot more. Okay, currently there are lots of people obviously in poverty. Um, we need to provide for the people that are in poverty, get them out of poverty, and potentially then also provide for another four billion on top of that. If you look at Luxembourg, how much they use per person? They're using 16 hectares per person of productive land, 16 hectares. So the amount the earth provides per person is 1.7 hectares, but they're using 16. In the US, they're using eight hectares per person. In Germany, five hectares per person. In Vietnam, it's 1.7 hectares per person. So they are currently roughly sustainable. And in Malawi, it's 0 0.8 hectares per person. So they're using less than the earth could provide them. Okay, all right. Um, to give you an idea of how many earths you'd need to um, have if everyone on the planet lived like that. So if everyone was like the average person from Luxembourg, then you would need 7.7 um, .7 earths to supply everyone. Okay, if everyone lived like the average American, it'd be five earths. The average German, 3.2 earths. The average uh, Vietnamese person, one earth. And the average person from Malawi, um, they would only be using 0 0.7 earths. In terms of the the amount of Earths we need, yeah, we could we could all live like the average Vietnamese person, and we could support seven billion. The issue is we're not going to stay at seven billion. Yeah, we likely to hit ten billion by twenty fifty if we don't do anything. Um, and from there on, you're up to um, very very high numbers. Um, some people point out that a lot of European countries have got small family sizes. Yes, they do, um, but each individual child from a rich country has the impact of 10 or 20 children from a poor region. All right, so I want to show you why there aren't more starving people, okay? Our people ask, well, hold on, why isn't there more starving people? Poverty is actually falling globally. So if poverty is falling and yet ecosystems are becoming more and more damaged and the environment is getting into a worse state, the only way to maintain that level of lifestyle is through using more and more fossil fuels. So what should we see? If we look at a graph of fossil fuel usage, what would you expect it to be like? Increasing, stable, or declining? Increasing. Increasing. Let's have a look. Now, since 1960, the population has doubled. But in that time, since 1960, the amount of fossil fuel use we've been using has gone up four times. That is why there's less people in poverty. It's because we're using huge amounts of fossil fuels. Okay, that is what is getting us out of poverty. It's what's making us rich as well. There's the downside, obviously, from climate change, um, but that's a consequence. Okay? A lot of the environmental problems we see are consequences of consumption and population. Those are the causes. Those two are the causes. So that's an issue. Okay, so how are we feeding people? How can you feed people with fossil fuels? You can't give them oil, coal, and gas, but how do you convert the gas, oil, and coal into stuff that we can use? or things that we can eat. Something that's feeding half of the people in this room. Fertilizer. Fertilizers, okay. So what should we also expect to be increasing rapidly in the last 100 years? Fertilizer use. So at the moment, most of our food, about 50% of the food that we grow today is because of artificial fertilizers, and these are made using natural gas. There might be other ways to make them. There might be other ways to make them, okay. The problem is, is inventing it. And when you're talking about technology, um, people often say we can invent our way out of this. All it takes is one person not to invent a way out of it, and you're in trouble. And when you think, right, which is the easiest way? Not to create the problem in the first place, or to get into the problem and then try and find your way out, which is probably the more logical route to take, is to avoid being in that situation in the first place. So to summarize everything that I've said, if people have access to contraception, poverty drops. If people have access to contraception, stability of countries increases. 
if people have access to contraception, the environment benefits. And if people have access to contraception, then um, equality rights increase. Um, so now that you've got this new information, and you're aware that in uh, many countries they need to cut back on either how much they use or their family size, you'd have three options. Those three options are cut back your consumption, and in some countries you're talking up to 80% less, okay? Have one less child, or a bit of both. Which of those do you think you'd be most happy to cut back on? Okay, if it's option A, option B, and option C, if you show me again. Okay, interesting. Okay, good, all right. Okay, thank you for your time.